This week, I'd like to talk about a concept that if you, if you don't understand it, then a lot of the New Covenant writings will uh, be a little bit muddier, a little bit less clear. And that is the concept that we have in English as peace. When we read peace, we can instantly kind of think, well, I know what that's talking about. I know what it is to be at peace. But it's this Hebrew word which is important to understand. Just like with grace, it's the word chayin um, that we needed to understand last week. Um, the word is shalom. Um, and it, it is the word shalom. It's not the word shalom. There is no ah oh sound in Hebrew to make shalom. So if we say Shabbat Shalom, it's a bit of a nonsense. It's kind of like an anglicized version. Um, there's no English word shalom. Um, what we're really attempting to do is to say the uh, Hebrew word Shabbat Shalom. Um, so the pronunciation would be according to the Hebrew, not according to our English uh, sensibilities. Um, but the word shalom, just like grace, you can see here is a noun. Also, you see it can be used as an adjective, but primarily it's a noun. It refers to the concept of shalom, what we would say in English as peace. Peace is, um, in English, also a noun, refers to a concept. But the English concept might lead us a little bit astray if we uh, try to put the English concept of peace over every time the Bible uses shalom or uh, the Greek um, translation of shalom, uh, you say bear. Um, if every time you see the word you say bear, you put peace, then you've gone from the Hebrew concept to the Greek concept to the English concept. So you're actually quite a ways away from the original concept of shalom. In Hebrew, all um, all nouns will have a verb root. And in this case, it is this word, which is shalom. Uh, we see it says here, completeness, soundness, welfare, peace. Um, and none of these words entirely encapsulate shalom. Shalom as we will see, is a state of things being kind of in unity. Um, if we can understand the verb root shalom, then we will understand more what shalom refers to. But first step, we just need to acknowledge that peace is not um, the entire concept. There are kind of little flavors of peace within it, um, but that word doesn't entirely uh, translate shalom. So the word shalom, so if we can understand the word shalom, it will tell us more about what shalom is. Uh, you'll notice down here in the Strong's definition, you have a reference to um, making complete and uh, paying, uh, repaying, to finish, to make full, uh, give again words like that. Um, so it's to do with uh, restitution. It's if you can think of it in um, in terms like to make something whole. So if somebody pays you you something and you repay them, then you have kind of made them whole again, we would say in English. Um, you have made them complete. Where there was something that was lacking, 
you have made them uh, complete. And if we look to when this word is used in the scriptures, um, it might interest you uh, where some of the, where it's used in some of the verses in the Torah. In Exodus 21, 33 to 36, it says, When a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit, does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey has fallen into it, the owner of the pit is to repay. He is to give silver to the owner, and the dead, that animal, is his. Um, but the, it's translated as repay there, which is not a bad translation to get across what it is saying. But the, the word shalam is used. And if we can understand that the word shalam is used and we get an understanding of what it is to shalam, is to uh, make something whole again, to restore something. Obviously, we know that uh, Yehovah, God restores us. He brings us, he shalams us um, and brings us to this state of... Um, but a fine translation, I was going to say, bad translation of peace. It's fine, but it's not complete. Um, ironically, um, he brings us to the state of Shalom would be a, a better way to understand it. And when the ox of, of a man smites the ox of his neighbor and it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the silver from it, and also divide the dead ox, or just the dead is what it says. Or if it was known that the ox was previously in the habit of going, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall certainly repay, we have in English, but in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew parallelism where the same word is used twice to kind of emphasize it. He shall shalam shalam, uh, ox for ox. So uh, just like you shall certainly die is you shall uh, moot moot. Some translations have it as Dying you shall die, um, but it certainly die often. Um, here we have certainly be pay, but it's shalam, shalam. But again, we've got this idea of something being wrong, something kind of being out of balance. The, um, the person's ox... Um, has gored another, and there's some kind of uh, problem that needs to be restored. The verb that would be done in that situation, uh, what Yehovah seeks to be done in that situation, is shalam, to bring the situation, if you like, to a state of shalom. In Exodus 22, 4-5, it says, if the theft is indeed found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or a donkey or sheep, he shalam, double. Okay, so translated repay. When a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare and lets loose his, li his livestock and it feeds in another man's field, he shalam from the best of his own field and the best of its own vineyard. So in order to make a restoration in this uh, situation that's described here, um, the person who is at fault would need to take of the best that they have in order to make a restoration in the, um, in the situation. But the idea of making restoration is to shalam. So in seeing how this word is used, we're getting a better idea of what it is to be brought to a state of shalom. 
when we talk about Yehovah bringing us peace, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about him shalom in our lives. Um, him bringing us to a state of completeness, a state of wellness, a state of restoration. Leviticus 5, 14 to 16 says, And Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, When a soul commits a, a trespass and a sin by mistake against the holy set-apart matters, holy or set-apart matters of Yehovah, then he shall bring to Yehovah as his guilt offering a ram, a perfect one from the flock, just like the guy restoring from uh, the best that he has. With your valuation in shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the holy or set apart place as a guilt offering. And he shall make good for the sin that he has done in um, sinning against the uh, holy or set apart matters of Yehovah. So it might be treating that which is holy uh, as if it is common. Uh, so a sin such as that, in such a situation, Yehovah has prov provided a, a way to shalom to make the situation right, to bring the situation back to how it should be, a state of shalom. Um, for the sin that is done, against that which is holy or set apart, and shall add one-fifth to it, and give it to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and it shall be given, forgiven him. So the idea of making atonement, making one clean um, after there's been some kind of uh, transgression, uh, we know from previous studies that that is done with offerings. Um, but it's interesting to me that the way that uh, one would shalom in this situation is not by the peace offering. Um, they are called the shlamim, uh, which is the, the plural uh, of shalom. The shlemim, um you would think to make peace, you would give a peace offering, but that's not how it's done. In order to shalom in this situation, one brings a guilt offering. So there are ways to bring shalom to the situation, to make the situation right. Um, which are prescribed by Yehovah. So to bring shalom to one's life, one would do all of the things that Yehovah prescribes in his Torah, to do what is good, what is right in his eyes. That brings shalom. Here, the thing that he tells one to do is to bring the guilt offering and to add one-fifth to whatever it was um, that you've sinned against uh, that was made holy to Yehovah and uh, you've come along and defiled it in some way. Uh, you add a fifth to it and you um, give a guilt offering and that will shalom in the situation, thus bringing shalom. In Deuteronomy seven nine to ten, it says, "And you shall know the Yehovah, and you shall know the Yehovah your Elohim. He is Elohim, the trustworthy Ale, God in covenant and kindness, for a thousand generations with those who love Him, and those who guard His commands or cherish His commands, shamar His commands. But repaying those who hate Him to their face to destroy them." He does not delay to do so with him who hates him. He shalams him to his face. And we've seen that those who hate Yehovah 
uh, pretend or feign obedience to him. Uh, so it's not a case of saying, oh, I love him in my heart. I feel well towards him. That's not loving him. Um, and neither is it to think badly of him in your heart, to hate him. Um, but we see the word shalam used again. So he doesn't just shalam those who do well by him, do right in his eyes. He also shalams those um, who do evil and their punishment is actually bringing things to a state of shalom overall. So he will bring shalom to those who do good and he will also bring shalom to those who do bad. Um, but those who do bad will not necessarily like uh, what it is to be at shalom. When you make a vow to Yehovah your Elohim, do not delay to shalom. Um, you've made a vow, you kind of set things out of balance. Um, there's something to be paid to bring things into restoration, to bring things to a state of completeness. So paying your vow is to uh, shalom your vow. Um, we see something interesting in uh, the book of Job. It says, Wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and is shalam? So the verb is used there. Um, again, if we say a piece, it kind of explains some of it, but Really, we need to understand what the Hebrew says to understand what is being said here. Uh, who has hardened himself against Yehovah? Who knows that Yehovah has said to do something or not to do something? And they've hardened themselves against him and said, no, I will continue in the way that I decide to. Uh, and is shalam or is in a state of Shalom, one could say. Um, one can uh, think oneself to be in a state of peace or shalom um, when one is uh, rebelling against Yehovah. We see in Deuteronomy 29 uh, that they bless themselves and say that they will have peace or shalom in their heart. Um, that's how the rebellious are. So they might well be at peace with how they're acting, but they're not in a state of shalom um, as Yehovah sees it. And it, indeed, he will shalom to their face. The word tamim is uh, closely related to this. So we've seen this word a lot. Um, complete, whole, entire sound. Um, and when I say that they're related, I don't mean linguistically. I mean uh, conceptually. So to be tamim before him, to be blemishless or perfect, as it sometimes uh, is translated, is not to never do anything wrong in one's life. It is rather to retain one's blemishless state before him, for that to be your intention. If you happen to transgress, um, as you likely will, uh, in trying to um, become tamim before him, um, then... That doesn't mean that you're not tamim, that, um, because your intention was to be tamim. You know what his word says. Your intention is to do it um, flawlessly. Um, if you stumble in that, it doesn't mean that you're not tamim. 
Um, but this is conceptually related. So to be in a state of shalom is kind of like what it is like to be tamim before him. So morally, you can be tamim, you can uh, be complete or whole in regard to what in regards to what he asks of you. Um, and if one is tamim morally before him, then one will be in a state of shalom. Shalom is kind of like a broader idea um, of tamim. It's kind of like the state of affairs is tamim um, when there is shalom. Um, but if one is rebellious to Yehovah, one can give oneself shalom in one's heart, but um, one would not be tamim before Yehovah, and one would not uh, be considered by Yehovah to be in a state of shalom. And really, it doesn't matter if we think that we're at peace. What matters is whether he thinks that we are at peace. I think a good illustration of the idea of shalom um, is the picture that um, I've used for the thumbnail. This idea of all of the individual strands coming together into uh, what might be a rope or into a thick, thicker cord uh, is a good illustration of it. To be at shalom is kind of to have all of the uh, components of one's life integrated uh, with one another. And the way to achieve that is not to do it according to how you think it should be done, but to do it according to how Yehovah thinks it should be done. Because you might think, oh, things are great. I've got peace, I've got shalom. When actually Yehovah looks at you and says, you know what, you really don't. Uh, you have deluded yourself in some way. And that word that I used, uh, integrated, really gets across uh, the concept. Okay, integrated. Um, the idea of everything working together, various parts being linked or coordinated. Um, this idea of integration um, really gets across what it is. Although, if we had um, Yeshua as saying, integration unto you really wouldn't uh, get across the idea um, as much as the word peace leads people astray. Unless you understand the concept of shalom, um, having it translated as integration uh, really wouldn't help. We see in Ephesians 6, it talks about the gospel or the good news. And it calls it the good news of peace. Um, the good news of in Greek you say bear. Um, but what it's referring to is this concept of shalom. Um, it's translated into Greek and it loses a lot of what it was originally. And then when we translate it into English from Greek, it loses even more of what it was originally. Uh, so the gospel of peace sounds lovely, uh, sounds kind of nice, but really it doesn't uh, get across to us what it is that Yehovah is offering to us, which is integration, it is shalom. Um, this is a phrase that um, uh, Peter uses in the book of Acts. Um, 
he says, bringing the gospel, peace through Yeshua Messiah. And again, when you kind of read that and you're not familiar with the term shalom, um, it can kind of sound a bit flowery, a bit like, oh, peace and hugs to everyone. But that's really not what it's saying. Um, what is brought through Yeshua, through his blood, through the cleansing from our sin, is a return to shalom. So this is shalom through Yeshua Messiah. We have these things uh, recorded for us in Greek, um, but we see Yeshua, for one, spoke to Paul in the Hebrew language. The language that they spoke was Hebrew. Peter was, in all likelihood, not speaking Greek here. And even if he was speaking Greek, um, since he was with the Gentiles, um, even if he was speaking Greek, he was using the closest word to the Hebrew word. Again, there isn't a one word that encapsulates uh, shalom in Greek, just as there isn't in English. Uh, so the gospel, bringing the gospel to you, is shalom through Yeshua Messiah. Romans 10, uh, verse 15, we see the good news of shalom mentioned um, again. We see Paul says here, as it has been written. So that tells us he is getting this from somewhere in the scriptures that he had. Um, and where this actually comes from is Isaiah 52. Um, in the Masoretic text, it says, uh, how pleasant upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news or the gospel, who proclaims Shalom, and it's the Hebrew word shalom which is used there. Now, if we look in the Septuagint, it says gospel of peace, glad tidings of peace or good news of peace. The word um, gospel of peace there, same phrase as is used in the uh, New Testament verses that we looked at. We see Yeshua use this, uh, this word that he uh, is recorded using the word Eusebia, of course, in the New Covenant writings. Um, but we kind of, we have some familiarity with the idea that he said, peace be unto you. Um, and if we understand the concept of shalom, then we understand better what he is wishing upon people. Shalom be unto you, this condition of completeness or wellness or restoration or being whole. Um, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. If we understand that shalom. Shalom I leave with you. My shalom I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In Luke twenty four thirty six, we see uh, what is usually translated uh, as peace be unto you. As they were saying this, Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But again, it's shalom to you that he, he is wishing them to uh, much deeper than him saying peace man or whatever uh, idea people have in their heads uh, John twenty nineteen to 22 says recording the same events it says and therefore it was evening on that day the first day of the week and when the doors were shut where the disciples met for fear of the Jews Yeshua came and stood in the midst and said to them, Shalom to you. And having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Master. Then Yeshua said to them again, Shalom to you. And it, it's much deeper what he is wishing to them uh, than just peace. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the set apart spirit. So notice, shalom to you. And it says, having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the fact that he had said, shalom to you, is important. Then it says that he said to them again. So emphasis is put upon this. Peace to you. Having said this, having said this phrase, shalom to you, he breathed on them and said, receive the set apart or the Holy Spirit. So a special emphasis is put upon the idea of him wishing to them shalom. And if we just think, just think he said peace, then it's kind of like, well, why is this important? And you could make a big deal of it and go off the English word. But if we understand that he is wishing shalom, wellness, wholeness, completeness to them, um, then he shows them his hands and his side uh, where he was pierced with the spear, presumably. Um, and when he says to them, shalom be with you. And then having said that, he gave them the uh, the holy or the set apart spirit. Um, things like this take on um, a clearer significance um, as to what exactly is going on. He is giving to them, if you like, a state of shalom, which comes from them um, seeing his wounds. And then them rejoicing when they see the master and them receiving the spirit, all of which give them shalom. John 20 uh, verse 26 says, And after eight days his disciples were again inside and Thomas, or Thomas with them. Yeshua came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in the midst and again he says to them, Shalom to you. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, we see uh, Yeshua being called Prince of Shalom. Prince of Peace just sounds like a nice title uh, in English. In Hebrew it is Sa Shalom. So Yeshua is Prince of uh, Shalom. So if we can see this concept for what it is, then we can see the things that are written in the uh, New Covenant writings in a new light. What Yeshua was saying to them uh, would bring them shalom. Um, we also see that Paul uses the word uh, often. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called uh, holy ones or set apart ones, favor or grace, chain to you and shalom from God. If we don't understand the word, where it comes from, then it's just kind of like a flowery nonsense. Peace, peace from God unto you it just kind of sounds a bit lovely and doesn't really have any substance. And if that's how we understand the word peace, then that's what we get uh, when it's used. Paul sometimes begins, as you see here, his letters uh, with wishes of shalom. And he always ends his letters by wishing shalom to the people after admonishing them for the uh, various transgressions, he wishes shalom 
to them. So if we um, if we understand shalom and we wish shalom to somebody, it's saying something a lot deeper that they would come to a state of shalom before Yahovah. So Paul is kind of can be interpreted as he is summing up everything he said in his letters by wishing shalom upon them. We see in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 it says, God is not God often translated of confusion, but of peace. So, if we can understand what shalom is, then we would expect um, this word here translated as disorder, sometimes as confusion, uh, to be the opposite of shalom. If shalom is to be integrated, then uh, this word should be disintegration. Um, and if we look at this word, instability, a state of disorder, disturbance or confusion. Often um, people will say, when they're confused about something in the word, they'll say, no, no, that's not right. God is not God of confusion. Uh, thinking perhaps that it means that they will never be confused um, about anything to do with God. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying he's not a God of disorder, of disintegration. Instead, he is a God of shalom. Um, and that is the state that we are brought to when we repent and we begin to walk in his ways. In Numbers 6, it says, Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face shine upon you and show chain to you. Yehovah lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. So this is actually how uh, Yehovah tells Aaron and his sons to bless the people. Um, and actually in the next verse he says, Thus you shall put my name upon the people. So Yehovah's name is not Yehovah, uh, just what he's called. It's also his character, um, his nature. Um, so it's interesting that in saying Yehovah give you shalom, that is how he wishes for his name to be put. Um, upon people because it, it is his name to give forgiveness to those who repent of sin. Um, it's his name to bring people into a state um, of shalom who will love him and will turn to him, who will enter into covenant with them and be at, uh, be in rather, a covenant of peace. He is the um, he is the side of the covenant that has the power to do things like that in the lives of those in covenant with him. Um, he can bring shalom. He can uh, protect us. He can lead us through life um, because he is that side of the covenant, what he expects from us is that we would submit to him and that we would do the things that he finds uh, pleasing. And if we will do that, he will bring shalom upon us because that is his name. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 13 says, For thus said Yehovah, when 70 years are completed at Babel, Babylon, I shall visit you and establish my good word toward you to bring you back to this place. So this is when uh, the Jews were in exile in Babylon. For I know the plans that I am planning for you, declares Yehovah, plans of shalom 
and not of Ra, uh, of evil, fine translation for the purposes of this, to give you a future and an expectancy. So Ra is uh, when things are not fulfilling their potential, when things are not in the state of shalom, they're not how they should be. Um, people often misuse this verse. You know, they will uh, send it to people when they're having a hard time or whatever, when actually it's a prophecy that was given through Jeremiah that their exile in Babylon was not the ultimate end for them that he has plans of shalom um, and he would bring them back uh, to the land uh, just as we are uh, exiled among the nations at the moment but we will all be brought to the land of Israel in the kingdom uh, because he has plans of shalom for us also. Then you shall uh, call on me and shall come and pray to me, and I shall listen to you. And you shall seek me, and shall find when you search for me with all your heart. So as we saw last week, uh, if you turn your ear from hearing the Torah, even your prayer will be an abomination. Uh, not If people didn't know what the Torah was, uh, that their prayer is an abomination, but turning your ear from hearing it is uh, is quite another matter. Um, Yahovah wishes to bring us to a, a state of shalom. But if we will turn our ear from the very thing that is supposed to bring that state of shalom, then what is uh, Yahovah to do? Uh, so if we seek him, Truly, we seek him, who he is, and not some false god that has been put in his place. Uh, then he has plans to bring shalom in our lives. In Second Corinthians 13, verse 11, it says, For the rest, brothers, rejoice. Be made perfect. Be made tamim, whole, complete, sound. Be encouraged, be of one mind, live in shalom, and the Elohim of love and shalom shall be with you. Again, if we don't understand what shalom is, then this verse can kind of sound like a trite platitude, uh, which doesn't at all accord with who uh, Paul is. It's saying live in shalom which is done how? By doing the Torah, by following his instructions. And the God of love and shalom shall be with you. Uh, if you follow his instructions, you walk correctly before him, you don't turn your ear from hearing the bits that you don't like, he will bring shalom in your life because he is a God of love and of shalom. Romans 9, 6 to 7 says, For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and shalom, which gives us a much more complete picture of what is being said here. A life accords with the idea of shalom in a way that it doesn't accord with the idea of peace. He brings about abundance. Um, he brings about the way things are supposed to be. Um, he brings life into the situation. He brings a state of shalom. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity towards Elohim. For it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim, neither indeed is it able. So if you find yourself unable to subject yourself to the Torah of God, Paul says that is because you are going after the mind of the flesh. 
and that is death. That will lead you to death, uh, rebellion and death, ultimately the death of one's soul. Uh, the mind of the spirit is contrasted with that. That is to be subject to the Torah of God. And that is life and shalom. So if you want life in shalom rather than death, that's how you do it. You subject yourself to God's commandments and they will bring blessing and abundance in your life. Uh, whether that's financial or not. Jeremiah 6, 13 to 14 says, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, they are all greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, all act falsely. And they heal the breach of my people, saying, in English, peace, peace, when there is no peace. But um, the words used in Hebrew are shalom, shalom, when there is no shalom. So there are people who will promise you shalom. They will speak all these great words about Jesus and about how he, he will bring peace into your life. And none of it is actually founded on anything real. And none of it has any substance. But if you understand uh, the concept of shalom, then you can understand that what they're promising, uh, as said here, um, they're promising shalom, or they're saying that things are in a state of shalom, when in fact there is no shalom. Isaiah 57, 18 to 21 says, I've seen his ways, but now I heal him, says Yehovah, and I lead him, and shalom comforts to him and to his mourners. Okay, so Yehovah is describing a, a state of shalom here. He will heal us and he will le lead us. Creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off. Or shalom, shalom to him who is far off. And to him who is near, says Yehovah. And I shall heal him. So there are people who will promise shalom and say shalom, shalom when there is no shalom. But Yehovah says, come to me and I will bring you shalom. But the wrong are like the troubled sea, for it is unable to rest and its waters cast up mud and dirt. There is no shalom, said my Elohim, for the rasa. So the Rasa are promised shalom by those who would lead them astray. If you're told you're in a state of peace with God, but you haven't come into submission to his um, instructions, then that is deceit. Uh, you are being led astray. There is no shalom Two people who will not uh, bend the knee to Yehovah and follow him where he leads. But to him who comes to him earnestly, genuinely, then Yehovah brings shalom in their lives. Um, Yehovah is the only one who can do so, although whoever can promise shalom and can speak about peace and love and make it all sound lovely uh, when in fact what they're telling you, what they're teaching you is the opposite of what will bring shalom. Such people will be shalom by Yehovah. He will shalom them to their face um, because he will repay what is in their heart, which is a desire to disobey him. They can say with their mouths that they want to follow Yehovah, that he's the God of love and peace and all the, all the rest of it, um, but really have just completely missed 
uh, what Yahovah is actually promising um, miss the actual peace or the actual shalom the Yahovah wishes to bring in their lives and will stubbornly turn their ears from hearing what Yahovah actually has to say and will listen to uh, the people who are kind of telling them a lovely story um, that accords with what they might read in their English translations in their Bible and not go back and understand what these concepts were from the beginning of the Bible. Psalm 50 verse 16 says, But to the Rasa, those who have no shalom, God said, What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant in your mouth? So they have no shalom because Yahuwah's laws, his covenant of peace um, is what brings shalom. And they can say that they're in covenant with Yahuwah, um, but Yahuwah says, essentially, how dare you say that you're in covenant with me and not be submitted to me. Yahovah willing, I'll see you next week.